Hi everyone, it's Stephanie with The Patient Story. I hope you're doing well wherever you're joining us from. I'm really excited to introduce our guest today who is going to be the first uh, to share her story in this category. And so with that, Mary, thank you so much for spending the time with us to, to share your story and help others. I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, Mary is joining us from the Bay Area where that's my neck of the woods. Um, and you know, I know there's a lot about you that I'd love for people to know about outside of the cancer context because we are so much more than our diagnosis. So could you share a little bit about yourself? Sure, first of all, I'm 59. Um, and until this diagnosis four years ago, I thought I was in pretty darn good health. Um, I'm a mom to two adult sons, ages 29 and 31. I'm a nurse, I've been a nurse for 36, almost 37 years now, but I haven't practiced clinically in about 23 or 24 years because I'm administrative in healthcare. I'm now the CEO of a nonprofit that does business as a, a life plan, multi-level retirement community. Um, I'm also an artist and I, I, I do a lot to do creative stuff. I have a little puppy, 15 months old. We walk a lot. We're outside. I'm newish to San Francisco this past year. So I'm outside just exploring a lot. And you were just saying you explore via three to five miles of walking every day, which I just thought was, <laughs> I'm going to borrow it's, that. <laughs> you know, a long time ago, I, I realized that the fatigue that I get as a side effect of my cancer um, is not helped by napping for me. It's helped by pushing through and, and walking. And, and that's really been kind of treatment for me is to be able to keep my energy up by adding to it with walking. I think we're starting off already with a great sort of tidbit for people, right? Who may also have myelofibrosis and uh, take away that, hey, one way of pushing through for some people, for some people is by getting outside, walking around. Um, thank you for sharing all of that, Mary. Um, so now that we're talking about the myelofibrosis, let's rewind back to 2017. It's the early part of the year. You start feeling symptoms. What were those symptoms? And when did you start seeking me medical attention? Well, I'd probably had these symptoms for a couple of years, but being a nurse and being a healthcare professional, I kind of blew them off and just thought, oh, come on, keep going. But my symptoms were fatigue um, and um, a vague kind of dizziness, vertigo-ishness, but having never had vertigo, I just kept calling it dizzy. Um, but it finally got bad enough in early 2017, the fatigue got so overwhelming that um, I, would, I would feel like I needed to take a nap by two o'clock in the afternoon on my floor of my office. I mean, literally wanted to just put my head down, shut my door and, and go out. Um, and I thought maybe I had, you know, like um, mono or something like that. I thought I had something really simple. I kept feeling for my lymph nodes and things like that. Um, it never occurred to me that I would have a major diagnosis. I thought I just was stressed or overworked when I went. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, who, who, who jumps to cancer first, right? We're, we're taught not right. to anyway. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, and, and in fact, my doctors didn't really jump to cancer. It took me months of, of kind of pushing um, right. that this was bigger than, you know, it wasn't mono um, and, and they didn't want to do much more. They kept saying, Oh, you have a big job, you're stressed or, you know, you, you have a lot, you're, you do a lot, you know, rest more. And, and um, they tried to tackle it trying to, at first they looked at sleep apnea. Was I not sleeping well? And that's why I was fatigued during the day. I didn't have sleep apnea. Um, and it wasn't until finally June of 2017, I just put my foot down. I said to my doctor, I'm not leaving until you draw blood. And, um, and I didn't know what that blood was going to tell, but I, I just really felt like we needed to do something. And that's exactly what we did. We drew blood. And about three days later, I got a phone call uh, and I could already see on my app, that my platelets were high. I think they were about 800,000. And, um, and so I was concerned and of course, Googling to see what high platelets meant. And I asked my doctor for some information over the phone when he called me to explain my platelets were high. And he said, well, we're sending your lab work off for some special testing. And I said, what kind of special testing you want to enter? You want to ask me? Yeah. That? Well, before we get into the testing, I do want to rewind back to two quick points. One, is when you talked about the dizziness, right? You said it was vertigo, but you thought it was dizziness. I would like for you to explain what the difference is for people. So 
early on, I didn't really appreciate what the difference was. I just knew that I felt lightheaded. I felt like sometimes the room was spinning. And on rare occasion, it felt like the hand of gravity was coming out of the sky and just knocking me over. That's when I started realizing it was vertigo. Vertigo, so we're used to dizziness. That's when we feel off balance and, and our head spins. When the room spins around you, that's vertigo. When the room is spinning, that's vertigo. And, or, or when something external, I call it the hand of gravity. It felt like something external was pushing me and I had no choice but to fall over. That's okay. what I was experiencing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for making that distinction. Uh, I don't know how common vertigo is as a, as a side, you know, as one of the symptoms, but regardless, it's good, I think, for people to understand that. And I can appreciate the second point of you saying you had to really demand. You knew something was going on. They were saying all these other things. Look, doctors do have to start from the most common explanations and then whittle it down. So we get that. But at some point, if you feel that there's not really the listening happening in terms of no, it's, you've already done this, done that. It's none of those things. That's when you, Mary said, all right, we're going to do this. So now you're talking about this testing. It finally got to this point of, we're going to send off the blood for special testing. So in June, end of June, I finally had this lab work drawn and my platelets are high, I think in the 800 thousands. And of course I'm worried about it. My doctor says to me, we're sending the labs off for more testing. And I said, what more testing? He said, special test. And I said, can you tell me what? And he said, I don't want to worry you. We're just sending it off for testing. I'll get back to you as soon as we have more. Well, it turned out that that special testing was they were sending those vials of blood off for genetic testing to a lab in Florida um, to see if I had any genetic mutations um, that would, would further be the differential diagnosis in my, in my uh, treatment and define my treatment. They send it off. How long does it take? Because as we know, waiting is another part of this. So I did. I waited all summer. This That, that initial uh, lab draw was, I'm going to say like June 20th or something. And it wasn't until I find, I, I would call my doctor periodically and say, hey, do we know anything yet? And he said, no, as soon as you know something, you'll get a call. And I, I did get a call. Um, I, I called him again on something like October, I mean, excuse me, August 27th. And I got off the call with him and the nurse called me and she said, hi, this is Susie from hematology oncology admitting you to services. And I was stunned <laughs> that I was being admit to, admitted to an oncology service without anybody telling me I had any oncological disorder. Um, so that happened. And that was, so that was late June with the labs, late August was when I was getting results. Of 2017. Yes. And, and so like, often I'll ask people, so how did you, was it a call? Did you get the doctor to tell you in the clinic or in the room? And you're saying you didn't really get either. It was, it was just a call from so oncology. I called my doctor the very same day that the nurse called me to admit me to oncology services. I called my doctor and clearly, I think he really felt like this is bigger than me. I don't even know how to talk about it. So I'm going to let those oncology people talk to you about it. So he kind of blew me off. And literally seconds after I hung up with him, the phone rang and it was this nurse saying she's admitting me to um, hematology oncology. And that was a Thursday. And I think I had the appointment the following Tuesday. My husband and I went in uh, to meet with the oncologist. That... Um, I can't even imagine like those few days in between, right? The Thursday you have the conversation, you don't actually go until Tuesday, you know, for anyone who's been through this process, that's an excruciating amount of time. Well, you know, the hard thing about it is it's, it's excruciating because you just want answers, but you have this thing called Google, which can and cannot be your friend. And, you know, I have a nursing background and I was a nurse at Johns Hopkins, Mass General. So I'm picking up the phone, calling everyone I know. And of course, everybody's telling me, look at this, do this. And so I had a whole lot of ideas of what it might be by the time I got to the office on Tuesday. Google is, yeah, it's what you said. It could be your friend. It could not be your friend. A lot of times, I mean, that's honestly why I wanted to start the patient story was to try to be an antidote to some of the things that I was <laughs> finding myself. And then with your, your, your nurse, nursing background, you know, I'm sure that was a, a help, right? Because you knew more and you um, had that background and you knew more people. But anyway, so you get into your appointment on Tuesday. Please describe how this was described to you. Okay. This was a really interesting place. Um, 
So we're sitting in hematology oncology waiting room and that's unnerving itself because all of a sudden you see yourself labeled very differently. I get called in, um, my husband comes with me and, and a, a, a female physician oncologist comes into the room and the first thing she said is, I don't want you to be afraid. And I said, should I be afraid? And she said, well, most people are afraid because they see the C word written all over our department. And I said, okay, it is the C word though. Are we not talking about it? And she said, well, I don't like to call what you have the C word because it scares you too much. And the C word is, is it, it, it just triggers things for people. So I don't call it the C word. We're just going to call it ET. And I said, which is essential thrombocythemia. And I said, okay, but isn't ET cancer? Oh, I don't like to say the C word. That was kind of how she presented it. And, you know, I'm thinking, this is crazy. So my, I looked at my husband and, and I said, can we stop for a second? I said, listen, I'm 55 years old. I'm a nurse. I'm a, I have a master's degree in nursing, not just a bachelor's. You know, he said, you can talk to me. We can talk about it as cancer. We can, we can talk about this. I've Googled, I've read, you know, and, and she said, no, I don't like to talk about it that way. And the other word we don't use is the treatment is also a C word and it's an evil, evil drug. So I don't like to call that what it is either. And I just looked at her and I said, I need to fire you. I need to get a second opinion because this isn't how I need to be talked to. What was going through your mind, right? Was, was it, look, I have a lot to deal with. I need to figure it out. I can't waste time, um, you know, not no, addressing it. It. It, felt, it felt so odd to be treated like with these kid gloves because I felt like, I'm ready for this. You know, um, what, what this oncologist didn't know is my mom, my dad, excuse me, had a rare blood cancer and died in 1989. And, and, and I knew, I know a little bit about this and, and what, what she didn't also appreciate was that I'm pretty realistic and I, I wasn't like terrified of dying as much as I was terrified of not having the right information so I could live. Um, and, and when she was treating me like, it, it felt so childish to call it the C word and an evil, evil drug. Um, and when I asked her to not do that and she continued, I just felt like this isn't a good fit and this isn't how I wanna start this journey. Um, right. I just no. felt it, it was kind of, um, I felt really diminished by her in, in, that, in that respect. And, and I wanted to start out strong. I wanted to have a, a partnership with this, with this oncologist, because I felt like I was going into a fight here for my life, right. and I wanted to really trust somebody. I, I think what you're highlighting is in, incredibly important for, for providers to hear, honestly, for these doctors to hear, which is, it's okay to have different styles, but it's the most important, I think, to hear where your patient is coming from. And if they, and you were very direct, right? If they're very direct in telling you what they need, I think, you know, you can't be like, no, you got to abide by my rules. It's Let's talk in the language the patient wants to. And then what's in the back of my head in this? By now, by the time I got to that appointment, I had already found the MPN Research Foundation, for instance, online, because I knew with platelets in the 800,000, I likely had ET. I, I didn't think I had myelofibrosis yet at that point. I was just thinking of ET. Um, and so I found the MPN Research Foundation and found out that the the insurance provider I was under, which is large in, in California, it's a it's an HMO in California. Um, they had no MPN specialist, period, the end, zero listed through the research foundation. So I knew that I was going to be getting kind of garden variety hematology oncologists. And, and I'm, I go to this first appointment feeling like I kind of knew a little bit more than my doctor did. That was unnerving. Right. And you're highlighting a very important point here. It, you know, applies to these more rare cancers, right? Which is there are specialists because, you know, there are developments happening. It's a very particular kind of disease and working with specialists, if you can, obviously it can be difficult depending on where you are, but if you can, is such a boost. And if you're in the community, oftentimes you can request that they work with the specialist, right? So, um, so you knew that Mary for yourself, you requested a second opinion, a second doctor, you were, um, you know, you went to one in the same system and, and how did that go? So I, so a couple of days later, I was brought into a, a male, her male colleague, and he said, and my husband was with me and he said, 
why do you think you need to see me? And I said, oh, wait a second. We're not going to start off on this foot. I said, please don't, don't label me as like an asshole patient because I asked for a second opinion. Please, please. And I explained to him that she told me about the C word and evil drug and all that. Oh, she also told me, she said, don't think of it as cancer. Think of it, you're a farmer who planted two crops of corn, but four crops grew. And that was kind of what made me go, okay, we're done. And when I told the second doctor that, he said, wow, that was a bad experience. And he became much more human and listened to me and he was wonderful. But he immediately said, I don't think you have ET. Your platelets are high, but your red blood cells are, are high. And I said, no, they're not. My red cells are still normal. My hemoglobin's normal. And he said, I think you have PV, polycythemia vera. And I said, I, I'm not understanding this. Why? And he said, well, your, your red blood cells and your hemoglobin are, are pushing to high. They're, they're high normal. And, and right away, he said, I think you'd, you'd really do well on Pegasus, which is pegylated interferon. And this was the first anybody had talked to me about starting a treatment. The last gal had said, you know, you're early in this. You're not going to start treatment anytime soon. And the second doctor really was pushing for me to get on pegylated interferon, which was a bit unnerving because I didn't think I had PV. I thought I had ET. Um, so then, so then that started. So before we shift and we are going to now into, into the treatment um, part of the story, what is your overall sort of a message to patients and caregivers um, on, mm. you know, what you learned the most in that one part of the experience? Number one, trust your gut. If you, if you think you have pain or vertigo or fatigue, don't let anyone talk you out of it because you're right. You know yourself. Number two, find a physician that you can connect to who will listen to you and who values your input in the treatment plan. Um, connect yourself to a, a research foundation or a group that can find you experts or local support groups find those groups. There are Facebook groups. There are, there are, you know, there are different hospitals have groups, but find those groups. There's patient, there's all kinds of stuff online um, to connect to and, and, and connect to people who have gone the path before you because you need their advocacy as well. You need to learn from what, what they have, have gone through. And, and above all, get to a center that has a, a, an MPN research foundation, it has a, has a specialist, an MPN specialist on their, on their staff, period. Period, okay, thank you, Mary. Yeah. That, those were really a uh, great summary. Uh, so that was a great summary of these different learnings that you had taken away yourself. Now we're going to uh, shift for the next segment uh, to talk about your treatment. And so that will be video two of Mary's story. <laughs> 